my name is Colleen Velo. I'm standing alongside Jeff Beck, and we're going to be talking about smart things with Cassandra for the first nine years. It was eight years when this talk was originally envisioned, but due to the rescheduling, it got changed up to nine. So, like I said, my name is Colleen Velo. Um, I started working with Cassandra when I joined Smart Things in 2015. So, I've been with Smart Things about eight years. Um, I'll toss it over uh, to Jeff. I'm Jeff Beck. I've been doing Cassandra for about a decade. I'm aging myself by putting my MVP award up there, but I'm still <laughs> really, really proud of it. I'm really so. proud of it too. So, <laughs> okay, so. For the agenda, what we want to do is kind of set the landscape of where we started with Cassandra, talk about how we've progressed through the various challenges, you know, including problems of scale as you um, usually get, and then kind of settle on where we are present day and kind of the lessons that we learned through our journey. So smart things at a high level in case people aren't familiar with it, it's basically an IoT platform. Um, we were acquired by Samsung in 2014. Um, and God, how many, I think we have over like 200K events processing through our system now. You forgot to say a time period. 200,000 events a second. Oh, thank you, yeah, 2,000 <laughs> events per second. Thank you for the correction. Two th just 200,000 events uh, total. Yeah, no, per second. Um, so at a high level, kind of walking through the uh, timeline uh, paradigm here, like I said, Sam, uh, Samsung acquired SmartThings in 2014. 2015 was um, we had a single single application monolith, single Cassandra ring in a single region in a single repo. So the way most startups start. Um, 2016 started expanding out into different AWS regions, which meant the rings also expanded out into the different AWS regions. Um, we also set up our first global ring. Um, and so we had several shard level, what well, I'm gonna say region level rings, and then a global ring with multiple data centers. So um, moving on to the middle time, um, that's when we started the one app launch. And basically that was kind of the merging of smart things had their own mobile app. Samsung kind of had their own mobile, mobile app and we wanted to merge it into one brand. So we did that uh, as well as starting to onboard T, um, T, Samsung TVs is OCF device, excuse me, devices. as devices. Yeah, forget about the OCF part. Um, after that, then, uh, see if I can. there we go. After that, in kind of the mid data center or the mid journey, um, started doing re-data centering and that's so we could both expand out um, and we started doing some stuff with more, uh, more embedding of hubs. And then fast forward to today, more Samsung appliances, which are coming through as devices and full microservice model with the monolith um, decommissioned. So um, starting at the beginning, like I said, it was a single monolith app, single DC, single, uh, single US, mono repo, we expanded out into the two regions. We was using the EC multi-region snitch for that um, because at that point in time, AWS did not have multi-region peering. That didn't come till 2017. So we were on public facing networks. Um, some issues or some challenges that we had, backups, restores, repairs. Um, we was on DSE data stacks at that, data stacks enterprise is what DSE stands for at that time. And Op Center, um, the solution for backups and for the repairs that was being offered by DataStax didn't quite work for us at that time. We were at an, on an older version of Cassandra and that probably played into it. Um, so we ended up with a home road solution, which also had some shortcomings. It, locking issues, there was a lack of monitoring, there was not a lot of visibility into the job status, et cetera. Um, for the monitoring metrics, we were using the DataStax Op Center, which, you know, I did like the color, coded, uh, color coordinated, you know, if your cluster's running hot or if it's in the yellow or if it's in the green, but you were limited on the metrics that you could get from that. Um, it also, as I recall, didn't have a strong RBAC model, so only we could look at it. Yeah, yeah. When we, the RBAC model was okay, but we also didn't have a super mature uh, authorization inside the company either, so we kind of solved for that by limiting people that could touch it because that's easy. 
Yeah, so the long story short, only the um, cis, pe cis and min people could look at it. The devs often could not look at it. So um, configuration management, we were using, again, a kind of a home world script for deployments um, written in Python. So, so the application side, as we uh, look through this, um, we were at a place where we were trying to scale Cassandra to lots of the company all at once. And so we took the effort to say, we're going to build libraries that have opinionated like best practice settings baked into the libraries. Um, we switched over to doing a lot more in the open source world and saying, look, in the framework, let's build the connections deep into the framework, things like Cassandra, uh, Rat Pack and uh, Drop Wizard, and tying that into the execution models, native promise frameworks. That was all really important to our developers. And what we were working on here is really saying, let's, uh, in the early years, abstract away as much as the like details of, of the inner workings of Cassandra from it. Now, the timed and windowed compaction jar is something we actually started, uh, time windowed compaction jar is something where this partnership between our operations and application side became really interesting. So we were facing the need to start de building and deploying a jar with all of our instances because we wanted to use time window compaction before it hit mainline. Absolutely amazing thing, but if you have a traditional relationship with operations, that's challenging. And so app teams were like, oh, we write everything in Java. We can build a pipeline, our own pipeline to make sure we have builds quick and did all that. So that was the kind of partnership that was really exciting in this era. So we would build jars. You would somehow make it appear on every server for me. So I didn't have to worry about it. Yep. Um, and then we, we continue to move on. So that was the beginning years. Kind of the mid years, what was happening with the architecture is we still had the monolithic mo uh, model, but people were quickly realizing that that was not very sustainable nor scalable, especially at the rate that Samsung wanted to expand. So we started microservices rollout. If there was any new functionality that was needed, it was developed as a microservice and not bolted on um, to the monolith. And we started the very beginnings of starting to um, chop off functionality or migrate functionality out of the monolith and into microservices as well. So the start of that activity um, was happening here, as well as the one app launch, um, which again meant more rings. Scale. <laughs> and, more, and, much, and much, much more scale. We also started expanding out into the China region, you know, again, more applications and uh, more Cassandra rings. And we started to encounter um, very significant problems of scale, you know, highlighted by the Super Bowl, where we had um, kind of a bug in one of the TV apps with the volume up and down, which Jeff will talk about a little bit more. But basically, it would just cascade um, our platform with events. So for, oper for operations um, on, on the Cassandra side, we did another iteration of the backup tooling. Um, went away from the Chrome job because it was somewhat unreliable and you know we had problems like I had mentioned before with the locking and visibility. And we had somebody kind of do another in-house solution, um, Groovy based, and they wrote another backup solution for us, which did work well. Um, we had a process in place where we tested it daily, mainly using it to populate our analytics, clus uh, Cassandra clusters, which were you fed into uh, business data dog graphs. Um, we also changed our monitoring and metrics. Um, at this point in time, we shifted away from using uh, DataStax Enterprise, and we went to just open source Apache Cassandra, mainly, mainly um, derived from financial reasons. We wasn't using, really, the DataStax Enterprise features, and the Apache Cassandra one satisfied our needs and was very cheap in that being free. So. With the backup and restore, the solution was a lot better. It was a lot more robust, um, it was reliable, but we still had some sharp edges around that. Um, single point of failure, the person who wrote it was the, person who was the only person who really knew it in depth. Um, ironically enough, it also ended up being a monolithic code base um, because it, was more, it did more than just the backups and restores. Um, it was kind of uh, the developer's personal tool base, so we used it for a number of Cassandra-related activities. Um, and there still was a lack of monitoring and visibility, you know, when it, if, if it failed correct, um, if it ran correctly or if it failed, et cetera. Um, to, to give a sense of scale at this point, it's 
one global ring across th three regions and yep. then regional rings in at the order of six or seven. And of course, China being special because China's isolated, isolated tool stack, just to give the picture of what we're talking about. Right. Um, when we uh, moved from Datastax, uh, Datastax Enterprise to Apache Cassandra, we had to change up our monitoring. We lost a nice GUI graph. And since the rest of the corporation or the rest of the enterprise was using Datadog, we kind of doubled down on our Datadog graphs. We already had a couple of them, um, but they were fairly thin. And so the nice thing with that is, one, we ended up with a lot more robust graphs, monitoring a lot more metrics in a lot more detail. Uh, so following along with that, we could put in a lot better monitoring, a lot more early warning systems, you know, to obviously know about any issues or trends before the developers do. Um, the other nice thing about that, it was kind of gave us a single pane of glass, so the developers could actually take graphs off of ours and embed it in their graphs on Datadog. So it was just, um, there was a lot more change of information for the developers as well. Um, at this t point in time, we also started splitting, not Cassandra yet, but some of the other apps off into their own repos. One of the um, things of expanding into the China region is it kind of highlighted the limitations of trying to use a mono repo for all apps, all infrastructures, et cetera. Of course, like Jeff had alluded to, or Jeff has stated already, that meant more Cassandra clusters as well. Um, and at this point, we stopped using the uh, EC2 multi-region snitch as the default snitch for global rings and started uh, using the gossip, uh, sorry, I always mess it up, but the gossiping property file snitch as the default one. No, um, one, no one can say it correctly, it's fine. Okay, yes. DPFS, thank you, I yeah. So the, uh, the advantage there, which I'll cover in later slides as well, is with EC2 multi-region snitch, it is pretty much hardwired to take um, the DC name, the rack name, and it also requires you being on a public um, interface. For, uh, interface. Um, that's actually hardwired into the Java class. And like I said, peering wasn't cross-region peering wasn't available at that time. At this point, it was available, and we wanted to start bringing our rings inside and having them run on private networks. Um, one other thing that we did at this time is we migrated from direct attached storage to EBS volumes. Um, there was a lot of discussion um, around this and probably a lot more discussion to be had, but the main reasons why we wanted to do that after a lot of performance testing to make sure we wouldn't take any performance hits was we was hitting the issue where some of our data was growing so fast we needed the ability to be able to get more disk space very, very quickly without having to completely constantly roll clusters. Um, the other thing is that AWS was kind of starting at this time to offer more newer instance types with EBS backing versus direct attached, um, direct storage attached volumes, um, direct storage attached. Um, and it's, that trend seems to be continuing, unfortunately. Um, the nice thing here is that with EBS backed, we, it gives us the ability to be able to roll new uh, roll the cluster or do AMI rolls very, very quickly. All of our clusters are on AWS, and I probably should have said that at the beginning, so we're entirely in the cloud, nothing's on-prem. So if we have a zero-day exploit or you know need some security fixes, we can quickly tip up a new AMI and just bring the EBS data volume back and keep moving without having to keep restreaming all of the data. Um, the one thing that you do have to watch if you do use EBS is you really need to watch your IOPS and your throughput and make sure that those are really tuned so you don't risk having throttling on your Cassandra cluster. And I'll throw so that over to you. In the application, this is where we've had lots of fun stuff going on at this era. Um, looking at those move to Datadog was incredibly helpful because me as the application developer side, I started to pull more and more of those graphs deeper into my production monitoring, understanding, oh, uh, this is a, a write or a read heavy thing, and I see how the cluster is contained. Where we tended to like divvy it up, like uh, compaction settings, stuff like that, tended to be application concerns in our world, uh, not as much op operations. Operations had to make sure all the compactions were working, and they would come and be very nice about me waking them up when they weren't working because I, I messed them up or something like that. But that's where uh, that partnership was really evolving. And then at this point, uh, we 
had to start uh, hard coding the driver versions. Uh, so I, I don't know if anyone remembers, there was a bug for a while on protocol version upgrade where if one of the nodes during a release was upgraded, it would upgrade all future connections. It's a bug, it's well documented. We just then went to the stance of saying, okay, well, we're gonna set the protocol version in the settings on our application side. And that's the thing we had to know to make sure, again, we can do zero downtime uh, deploys. This is also where, uh, I believe this is the era where we ran into the interesting bugs of if you're using select star and prepared statements and then edit your table, the order of the select star uh, fields are gonna be out of order. Simple stuff, but again, this is in the application world, we weren't as deep into that. If anyone doesn't know exactly what I'm talking about, just don't use select star in production, just write out your fields and it'll be fine and you can forget it. And that's the level of like, we were trying to make those best practices and I don't know how much code is out there that all has select star that I 100% wrote myself. Like, th that was from those early years when we had that one thing, we weren't making that many changes, but then as we expand, that's exactly what's happening. And that's where we see, again, these earlier decisions start to come back and mess us up, but they work great to scale early. And right now, uh, this era is uh, working fine. So then we come to the era, I'm gonna call it the re-data centering uh, era because basically we went through and completely rolled all of our clusters. Um, and going back to what Jeff um, had just stated, when we initially set out and set up our Cassandra clusters, for the most part, we used a lot of the default values, not in all cases, but for most cases. And in some cases, specific, speaking specifically here, num tokens, the defaults really were not particularly good, thank you. Um, so with that, you know, we wanted to change the num tokens to be able to do, you know, any, if you have your num tokens too high, any streaming, as people who work with Cassandra will know, any streaming operations that you're going to do is going to become that much more painful, whether it's repairs or whether it's, you know, bringing in new nodes, expanding, shrinking, what have you. Um, some other challenges that got thrown our way is AWS decided it was going to decommission one of, its, one of its availability zones, and when you're running... Cassandra in the, uh, in the cloud, basically an availability zone is pretty much analogous to a rack. So basically they were gonna decommission one of our racks and so we wanted to um, basically bring up a new rack in the new AZ without taking any performance hits or obviously any downtime. Um, kind of alluded already to changing cluster level parameters. Uh, we wanted to change the endpoint snitch as well for our, our running clusters and um, in some cases for some of our um, rings that had a lot of high density nodes, although not as high as some, we wanted to be able to resize those up fairly quickly without having to spend days and days of restreaming data for that. So I have a note for the last Pickle article there. We followed a lot of the stuff in that, but and we also unfortunately suffered a loss of a data center as well. So being able to bring up a new data center, configure it the way you want, rebuild all of the data in it offline without any um, applications going to it and then saying, okay, we're ready and being able to push it over to it, it bought us a lot of value. Um, at this time, we also made another adjustment in our repair tooling. Um, before, we kind of had an in-house solution which was very, very poor um, and resulted in us not doing repairs nowhere as near as regularly as we should. Um, so we went with the open source Reaper tool, which was developed by Spotify, and rolled that out, and that has been working pretty well. So for us in the application side, um, thinking a little bit about um, all of the current uh, data centers and all of that like best practice that I baked into the tool in the early years, yeah, it was mostly wrong at this point, given our scale and what we were doing. So we had to go back through and change a lot of our drivers. That's when it started, our, our wrappers to those libraries. Now, it made sense when we were smaller, moving fast, and we deployed a lot of these things weekly or faster in many cases. But these have become really solid systems. Um, auth, our auth system at the time is, is completely backed by Cassandra, and it runs through every 
thing that you can think of for IoT because auth is incredibly important. I can auth sidebar about that with anyone that if wants to talk about auth. It's, it's a, a fun hobby. Um, <laughs> it weirdly is for me. <laughs> um, and then we also started to need to point apps not at the data center they're turning on in. So we had the configuration and these libraries set up so that when you turn on an app, it's like, oh, I know I'm in EU. I'm going to connect to EU as my default data center in the driver so that when you have a multi-region uh, deployment, it knows to send most of your, your requests there. And it's also, again, tr we want to reduce our spend on network transfer, so we're trying to align to the, to the, re the availability zones within the region and all of that. So we're trying to align all of that. And this is where it turns out we over-indexed on making it easy, and we needed that control and flexibility because we lost a data center and we're doing migrations where we have two, two clusters in the same region deployed and we want to be able to be more specific about what we're pointing to and moving around. Um, so that, that's mostly there. And then I think the rest of, of this era was really, um, maybe read the dates if you understand why it took us a really long time to do this safely because we were also, I think, learning how to do it very distributed. Uh, opposed to getting together in a room and doing it all at once. We got really good at doing massive data center migrations with little to no impact across running production where we were also getting an incredibly new set of like operational concerns because at this era we're also seeing massive shifts in how people use their smart home uh, because well, so many people had shifted to working at home during this era. So like we, we're operationally seeing massive shifts that were like, is this anomaly? Is this the new normal? I, I don't know I need a nap is usually my answer to that one. Yeah, so fast forwarding to present day, um, the monolith app has been sunset. Um, Woo. Yep, yeah. <laughs> we're up fully on a microservice model. We have over 300 plus microservices. Cassandra, um, Forgot to mention in the Redata Centering years, Cassandra also has been moved, each of the rings have been moved off into their own separate repos. So your blast radius is a lot smaller. If you're making changes, you know, you're only making, you only risk making changes to that one ring. Um, at this time, we're also using Spinnaker for rolling out um, deploys. And so you now have the concept of a canary where you can, you know, in our case, we call it a jailed no, where you can bring it up, take a look at it, make sure that stuff is set the way that you expect it to be set, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing Samsung have, you know, Samsung devices, a lot more Samsung devices coming through to our platform, which basically equivalent, um, equivalent to more events coming through for us. Um, at this time, we also re, um, retooled our backups and restores, and we're now using the open source Medusa, which is solved um, a lot of the shortcomings that we've had before. So now we do have good monitoring around it. Um, we do have good visibility into, you know, if it's running properly or not. Um, and all of the other pluses that you get with using an open source product. Um, no, no more single point of failure as well. Um, like I said, for configuration management, we're using separate repos for each of our Cassandra clusters. Um, and we're using Spinnaker for the open tooling and deployment. Um, I don't know if you want to say. Uh, the application we finally got to deprecate. The monolith was great. The reason that is in particularly interesting is it had very old versions of drivers, things like that. Uh, so getting rid of those. Generally, the Java drivers have done really good against uh, different versions of Cassandra. It's generally safe. It makes me really nervous just because that's the type of person I am. Um, the other thing, application side, that is kind of coming out with this is it's not really something to call out so much as we, we pulled out all of the like baked-in configuration that we had baked in as best practice. That's all gone now. We, we're more collaborative. But we have a much deeper trust for backups and restores for, yeah. for that. And that allows us the things like testing and automatically backing up, like using our automated backup to restore to what we consider analytics clusters. Right, which um, we are, which we were doing with Medusa as well. I yeah. forgot to add that in as well. But um, go ahead. App-wise, that's really good because then as my application developer, I don't have to let anyone touch my running Cassandra cluster except for me. 
I don't share. Yeah. Well, so, I don't. <laughs> so kind of at you know, kind of the um, high level lessons. Um, you know, we did do a couple of you know, roll your own solutions, and there you know, there definitely is a time and place for you know, having to do a roll your own solution. But generally speaking, in our case, for the most part, on the operation side, um, we've gotten better results out of the open source solutions. That being said. Um, the open source solutions had matured since the time that we did our roll your owns. So um, another big takeaway is not trying to double down so much on multi-tenant clusters. Um, that proved to be troublesome as far as troubleshooting, as far as tuning. You know, we did have, um, you know, at this point, you know, we're, we have two global rings and any number of single DC rings. And in one of the rings, we had a write heavy and a read heavy workload. And so it was just a nightmare to try to tune that. Um, we've had cases where we've had the noisy neighbor where one app was not misbehaving, but definitely sucking up a lot of the resources to the point where it was affecting the other ones, et cetera. So right now we try to keep, you know, single app per cluster, which keeps it a lot simpler. And another takeaway is really minimize the time of running mixed versions clusters. Um, that one I will really stress. You, when, you, um, when you're trying to do an upgrade, um, really sit down and plan that window pretty carefully. Um, basically, your cluster is, most people who've done upgrades know, your cluster is pretty much locked at that time. You cannot do any topology changes. You cannot do any schema changes or any streaming operations. So yeah, really try to minimize the time that you're running mixed versions. It, it sounds simple, but like, how, yeah, we, we've like both a, been burned like a, yeah, over I've, and over. So <laughs> yes. I would, put, I would put that one in red <laughs> if I could. Um, and I'll let you do the. So for the us, the minimi like takeaways, depending on where you are in your like application journey, s right now, I would say yeah, minimize uh, hard coded values. If you have good config management, figure out how to instill the best practice. But if you can't, it will last you a few years. Uh, you can get by three or four years if you hard code all your best practices into a library and, and distribute it in your. But just remember that you left it there. Don't forget, like I did, uh, we had a number of like weird anomalies. That's like, oh, right, that one bug where we pinned to version meant that we never went back through and cleaned it up three years later, and then we had to go through and clean it up. It, it's those simple things, but those are application level like concerns that you need that deep partnership. Um, and again, the whole minimizing hard coded values that's true, but remember, you're going to add that cognitive overhead for your developers that are, that are all about it. Um, and just, again, always partner deeply with ops. Like, we're up here together because, like, the best outcomes that I've ever seen in Cassandra is when the application teams and the operation teams are working together. As soon as we got those, those metrics, like, on the same dashboard as my application, uh, it's, it's been amazing. I, I remember looking at like IOPS bursting issues with AWS at the same time as like my through, my upper level throughput. So that's really fun. And like it's also where you know when you make a mistake in your app code because like nothing has changed in all of here and then everything certainly turns red and you're like, oh, I definitely did that to them. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Apology accepted. Um, these are some resources which has been helpful for me um, when I've gotten in various files, I, uh, various fires rather. Um, the AF Slack channel I found has been very responsive. Um, I've gotten a plethora of information from the last Pickle blog. I highly recommend reading that. Um, John Haddad's blog also has a lot of very good info, especially around tuning. Um, and the data stack stack of change, also very good. Same thing with uh, Planet Cassandra. And then there's the Apache Cassandra Corner podcast, which there's an episode where Jeff has been on, and which Aaron Plotz here does. So recommend those resources. There's a lot more, but these are kind of my top picks. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Any questions? And someone could check us on time. No, yeah, we're right on the time. I we'll answer questions until the, until the nice man that runs all the AV kicks us off. Yeah. <laughs> We got more than enough heads up yeah. on paper, but never enough time in practice. 
That's an, yeah, that's an accurate, that's an accurate statement. Yeah, always. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, once we had, um, there was a couple of our, there was, it affected, thankfully, only a small subset of our clusters. So once we nailed down um, the read data centering process, it wasn't too bad. You know, that plus using the, of the EV, plus the using of the EBS volumes allowed us to move through that fairly quickly. So, oh, um, I think he had one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, what would be your top three like villains in the scenario where you're like, yep, that passes them? Um, oh, uh, my number one villain of oh, that's happening again, is sp misconfiguring speculative ex execution because I misread yeah. where the decimal point should be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. That's and like, what would happen is it would it would like pop up and we're like, oh, we found another one where we didn't fix it. Uh, so like that was, that was my pain point. Uh, what were some of yours? Oh, God, I'm trying to think. Um. The thing that you always, I think, complained about to me was probably like uh, the back, everything around backups and like restores and like making, that was the one that was always cropping up as painful until we got really, really solid monitoring there. Like, yep, that's true. That was the area that was just painful because it wasn't as front and center. I think everything else, I think we just re ended up with unique problems pretty often. Uh, so they didn't repeat except for when I hard-coded something and it propagated throughout 300 microservices. I th uh, yeah, I think my big, I think probably my big, it's a, it's more gen it's a more generic one, um, more on the, op well, on both the operations and the um, developer side is you know, really double down on your metrics um, in a way, I mean, not besmirching the uh, data stacks ops center, but that was kind of, that was a little bit of a blessing in disguise with us moving to Datadog because we really could double down and pull a lot more metrics in and really tune them to what we needed to see. So you can put your own data in there as well. You can, yes. But it's not just going to be like system JVM. Right. Right, you know, like for like so, for instance, um, we could put in stuff. We could put in more specific metrics around EBS volumes. Oh. You know, the queue, and the latency, et cetera. We weren't clear about this, and we should answer this, and then we should stop because I'm looking at time. Okay. Um, the when when you talk about metrics, we were exporting almost all of the JMX table level metrics into right. into Datadog. So like we would see all of the table level metrics in Datadog in real time along with everything else, which was incredibly useful. All right. Yeah, that, that did kind of bail us out a couple of times, so. Thank you. We're done, okay. <laughs> yep, thanks guys.